E. Calloway Professor of Urban Education at Georgia State University. If you've been watching this series, you may now see in a clearer way that much of what we have been taught and are being taught about black people, Africans, were written in collusion with the slave merchants with European world domination in mind. You now see how racism corrupts and distorts everything in its path. For black parents should now see the need to question everything that Western education proclaims to be gospel. Because as we have demonstrated, many things that were created by Africans have been given a white face. I, I had uh, indicated earlier that we had, a, as, as, especially in the 18th dynasty, we have a number of the actual royal mummies. And we saw one earlier, uh, Second Enray, who started the War of Liberation, uh, which drove out the invading armies from Asia in the 17th dynasty and allowed the 18th dynasty to begin. And so what we have here are some of the royal mummies that I've been able to uh, locate. It's very hard to find these royal mummies, but when you look at the royal mummies, you'll notice that their skin is black. This is Tutmosis the first. Uh, this will be Tutmosis the second. Uh, this will be Tut, uh, Tutmosis the third. Now this is not his mummy. We will see his mummy, but I wanted you to see this uh, uh, red or pink granite statue of Tutmosis the third. Uh, at, this is in the British Museum, and uh, the reason for this is, uh, the reason I want to stop and emphasize this particular pharaoh of the 18th dynasty was he was the one that carried the extent of the Egyptian empire mm -hmm. when it became an empire, all the way up to the, Tig uh, to the Tigris uh, River, uh, to the Euphrates uh, River, and up into what would be Persia and so forth. And even parts of Europe, this, this pharaoh conquered and was ruler over what was then the known world. He's one of the, uh, probably uh, the most powerful pharaohs in Egyptian history. And again, from his facial features, he is black. Now, let me point out, the, the faces... Yeah. Now, you're talking about black people, Africans. Yes. Uh, dominating. Yes. Much of the world. That's right. This is contrary to what we have been taught. That's why I'm that, talking that about we, it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm that we've that. always been slaves and that our, that's right. our and, roots start with roots. Right, and that's clearly incorrect. Uh -huh. It's clearly incorrect. And see, one of the ways you perpetuate that notion is that if you think about the images that people have when they think of Egypt, you think of Nefertiti, uh, you think of Cleopatra, uh, and other figures that, and some of which I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. uh, other figures that appear to violate the principle that I talked about earlier, which was that this was a native black African people who populated and ruled Egypt. And so this is why when I show you pictures like the one that I just showed you of Tutmosis III, uh, it clearly doesn't square with the picture that people have of Nefertiti that's in the, in the Berlin Museum. And the overwhelming uh, uh, number of portraits that we have and mummies that we have of the royal family show them clearly to have been an Africoid people. Okay. Uh, uh, now the mummy of Tutmosis III is the one in the center and so you can see that uh, from that pink granite statue that you just saw to the mummy that there's a very close correspondence so it's not just simply artistic license it's really good when you actually have the mummies to look at. On the left you can see a picture of an Asian uh, in terms of stereotype at least uh, stereotypical Asian features for that mummy. On the right, you can see a uh, uh, picture of uh, the mummy, and that's supposed to be Setai I. Uh, according to Doc Ben, Joe Cannon, the nose on this mummy uh, did not exist when they found the mummy and was added on later. And you see that uh, the nose that is, is there is an aquiline nose. Uh, although many Africans have af aquiline nose, uh, if, the, if the mummy didn't have a nose, it would, in my opinion, be an error to give it a nose. Uh, right. It's a way of uh, distorting history. Uh, but the one in the middle is that's the one you, that I wanted to show that's you. That's what you call a real nose job. A real nose job. <laughs> the original nose job. <laughs> original, right. <laughs> okay, Tutmosis the fourth. You remember we talked a little bit about uh, the debate that occurred when all of these mummies kept turning up black and mm -hmm. the question uh, was raised, well, uh, is this really the way the skin was in life? And uh, the answer that was sometimes given by those who studied mummies was that the embalming fluid was responsible for a change after death in the color of the skin, which prompted Dr. Shekanta Diop to uh, 
uh, uh, develop a skin test uh, chemically to determine uh, the composition of the melanin, uh, melanin in mm -hmm. the skin. And then uh, when he was allowed to do these tests, clearly they were, uh, they were black people. And as a result, he wasn't able to do uh, the, uh, the rest of the test uh, okay. the, with the uh, royal mummies. Uh, this is a picture of, I think this one is uh, Amenhotep the uh, uh, second. Uh, this is, uh, this is the nurse of, uh, Amenhotep II, and Amenhotep, and notice that she's portrayed as a, a black woman, as is he here in the pictures. Uh, this is Amenhotep II, uh, this would be the grandfather of, Tut of, uh, King Tut, um, and, um, the grandfather of Pharaoh Akhenaten as well. Uh, okay. What I'm trying to do in this next uh, few series of slides is to give you more of a family portrait. So if you look at, uh, I'm in hotel, uh, by the way, in the Cairo Museum, uh, contrary to the placement of, of the scribes that I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. uh, that look as if they might be European or white in appearance, contrary to the central uh, attention that was given to those slides in the museum, you have this uh, particular statue of the Pharaoh uh, who was the head of the nation, and when you walk into the room that houses this, you can't see it here, but you can tell from the camera angle where I had to take this picture, he's sitting up above um, um, a um, statue of the cow Hathor, which stands for one of the goddesses, mm -hmm. and almost out of sight. You would, unless you had this statue pointed out, you would never see it when you walked into the room. What is the attitude of the mm -hmm. people at the Cairo Museum regarding the uh, the racial makeup of ancient Egypt? Well, you don't get much, uh, most of the people who work at the Cairo Museum, you, very, you usually don't get a chance to see them. The guides are the ones that the average person comes in contact with. But I had just recently, for example, a chance to talk with uh, some of the people in the uh, Cairo Museum, in fact, its director, uh, who uh, on a question like this doesn't seem to think what, that it's important whether it was a black or a white person. It doesn't come up as often with the people who are presently in charge. And, and there's good reason for it. I'm going to show you why that is true in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, and it has to do with the racial makeup of the current Egyptian population, yeah. Yeah. which is highly mixed. And you have in one family people who are very light and very dark in the same family. So for them, the whole racial issue uh, generally takes on a uh, different kind of meaning. But when I talked to the one in the Cairo Museum, he was able to identify uh, for me in their archive certain of the royal mummies that I was okay. looking for. You might want to also comment on mm -hmm. who the present people, people currently living in Egypt, right. who these people are. Right, well the people presently living in Egypt are settler population, just like the population of the United States is a settler population. Um, Europeans who left home and came to the United States now populate, are the dominant population in the United States. So, but you would not connect Europeans to the ancient history of the United States. So that the Arabic population that came in after Islam was established in the seventh century uh, and that's clearly after the whole of Egyptian history had been completed. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Greco-Roman part had been completed by that time. Uh, then uh, these people then are uh, what you would probably call Middle Easterners. But what we have to remember was that that was a mixed population too. The people who were in Saudi Arabia, the ones who were in Persia, the ones who were in Syria, uh, that that population had from almost the beginning of Kemetic times uh, had the benefit of Africans who moved out of Africa and mixed with those populations who had come from both Europe and Asia. So, you d so everyone understands that the, the population of the Middle East, I think most people who have studied it understand that that's clearly a mixed population. So if, so if the ancient Egyptians were to look at President Mubarak of Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, they would not consider him an no, no. And in fact, if you were to look for um, on the um, monuments for people who had that physical type, they're always shown as prisoners. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this would be Amenhotep the third. This is the father of Pharaoh Akhenaten. We'll say a little bit more about Akhenaten in a moment. Also, the father of King Tut. Now, there was some argument as to whether King Tut's father and Akhenaten's father were the same, which would make King Tut and Akhenaten, 
brothers. But uh, there is in the British Museum uh, a red granite lion that says that this pharaoh, and there he is with his wife. Uh, okay, if we could come out wider on that, please. I'm in chapter third. To pick and, up the head. Right, and uh, so I'm in Hotep III here with his wife, Queen T. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know if Queen T is Tut's mother, but she's Akhenaten, supposed to be Akhenaten's mother, and this is Akhenaten's mother and father, and the father, at least, of King Tut. So they would be at least half-brothers, because King Tut on this red granite lion says, my father was Amenhofis, or Amenhotep III. The Greeks changed his name to Amenhofis. And this is Amenhofis III, and you notice clearly that he uh, is uh, a native African, the wife is native African. You'll also notice that the man and woman are shown equally. They're, they're portrayed as equals. She sits right beside him. In fact, she's kind of got her hand uh, around his back and it's almost a, in a playful attitude that this stone carving comes to life. Uh, but uh, that emphasizes a point that I can make in passing that there was great equality of the sexes in ancient Egypt, in the, in the ancient Egyptian culture when women and men held equally prominent roles in the culture. Uh, this is a close-up of uh, Queen T, the m a mother of Pharaoh Akhenaten, uh, and we believe would also be the mother of King Tut, at least the Tell father was something the about Akhenaten. Okay, we're going to say more about it. <laughs> I know you want to hear about it. That's right. <laughs> so we will tell you all. <laughs> you, that's right. Tell it all. No, it's very, he becomes very important. And, and it's important, before, since we won't come back to these pictures, to keep in mind the image of his mother and the image of his father that I've just shown you. Let's go back and take another okay. look at the f mother and father side by side. And then this is a close-up of the mother. I'm sorry that I don't have this particular one in color because it's in a beautiful deep brown, uh, dark brown uh, color. And uh, clearly, she's um, a beautiful, beautiful black woman. Uh, now, uh, well, something didn't uh, fall. We'll see if we can get Akhenaten. Right. We'll f it'll fade to black. Okay. okay, Akhenaten, I had two pictures of Akhenaten. It doesn't matter, but uh, we can use this one. The other picture that I had of Akhenaten was in the San Francisco Chronicle. And the reason I wanted to show it was because it had um, a, uh, a, a piece of writing uh, that showed that the writer was concerned with his physical appearance and commented on the fact that he had, quote, swollen lips, uh, a puckered lips and fleshy nose. In other words, they were talking about his Negroid features as if they indicated illness. Yeah. And that was on the, uh, in the paper that reported on the that's, exhibit. That's still current, isn't it? It's still current, you see. So, <laughs> so you, can, you can see that Akhenaten is, is very mm -hmm. ill then, uh -huh. uh, by, if those features represent illness. Of course, there's a lot of people in the fact, valley. You, you look ill yourself. Yes, a lot of people, you were <laughs> ill. <That's, laughs> I was hoping to be able to get some recommendations <laughs> for medication. We're yes. all ill. But yeah. all in the valley, they're still ill uh -huh. uh, in the valley. So this is Akhenaten, and this is his wife, Nefertiti. Now remember I said this one then is very famous. This, this picture of Nefertiti is very famous. But Nefertiti is a foreigner who, uh, for, during the 18th dynastic period in particular, uh, the uh, pharaohs, especially the Tutmoses, mm -hmm. went to Asia and married the daughters of kings in Asia, in Syria, Assyria, as a way of solidifying uh, the, the, the empire. You know, that it was a political move and maybe it was more than political, we don't know, but yeah. we know that there were many, many Asian women who were brought in and who were wed to the ruling uh, pharaohs in Egypt. And so uh, this particular picture of Nefertiti seems less Africoid. And of course, this is the one that is shown in the Berlin Museum. Now, I might say one thing about this head. Uh, that head it doesn't have Nefertiti's name on it. It was found in an artist's workshop on the floor and so the assumption was that it must have been Nefertiti because it had a royal headdress, but it could just as easily have been one of the daughters of, of Nefertiti uh, and uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten. And we'll say something else about Akhenaten in just a moment. But I wanted you to see, uh, if, if okay. you could bring the slide back, I wanted you to see first Nefertiti, and then I'm going to go to another picture of Nefertiti because this particular picture is the one that is shown all over the world. Well, I'm going to show you one that's not shown all over the world and that we know to be Nefertiti because it's in Nefertiti's temple, and that's this one. Okay. Now, you notice she's gotten the same kind of sickness that her, her husband yeah. had. <laughs> her. Yeah. Now, the sickness that he was supposed to have had is Frolic syndrome. Okay. Uh, according to some doctors, they say, well, that would make 
a, a European swell around the lips and, and what have you. Uh, the problem with that explanation was that uh, Frolic syndrome makes you sterile. And uh, Akhenaten had six daughters, so he was anything but sterile unless uh, they had somebody uh, helping him out on the Maybe side. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, you notice that the physical features that are shown in Nefertiti's temple of Nefertiti shows her to be like all the other native Africans uh, in the... Now, is this a separate Nefertiti? Or? No, no this, is, this is the Nefertiti that we know as uh, Akhenaten's wife. The same Nefertiti, but if you look again, this is the one that, this is the bust. This is the, this one is, uh, it's a separate statue that was found on the floor, okay. whereas this is found on the wall of her tomb. This is carved into the wall, a relief her carving in her tomb, right. Now, her husband is the one who is given the credit for starting monotheism, or the belief in one God. And I tried to indicate earlier that this is totally in error. Uh, if you pick up the uh, Book of the Dead, which is the oldest religious literature in the world, the book of coming forth from darkness into light, the oldest religious literature in the world, it, it comes from a total position of monotheism. In fact, there is no point in Egyptian history where there is not one great God who has many manifestations, who is reflected with many powers. And so uh, what Akhenaten gave to the world was not the concept of monotheism, but the concept of a particular kind of monotheism, which then was picked up and seen as alien. In other words, there was a group of priests at Luxor who were called the priests of Amun. And so the name of the hidden god was Amun. Mm -hmm. Akhenaten, turns the, that monotheism into a new monotheism, and he chooses the sun as its symbol, and he worships Aten, which means that the old bishops are being put out of power. And you know what would happen in the Baptist church or the Methodist church or any other ch Catholic mm -hmm. church if you suddenly uh, got a new religion. Let's take the Catholic church in, in Italy and a new religion. That would put all the priests out of power. So there was an internal warfare over this uh, move by Akhenaten, which was really a move to dominate politically uh, the, uh, the country. And in fact, we believe that uh, Akhenaten may have, we don't know, but he may have been uh, assassinated uh, because he seemed to have met an untimely death because he was taking the country in another direction religiously. I got a big question for you. Okay. Marty's asking, well, right. what does this have to do with black folks today? Uh, does the uh, religion of Pharaoh Akhenaten, it has a lot to do. For example, we call ourselves monotheists. Uh, black people today are the most religious people on the face of the earth. And a knowledge of the history of the religion that we hold, I think, is essential to understanding the, the religion. Uh, for example, the idea that Africans were not monotheists before uh, the Hebrew religion or the Christian religion is totally false. We've always been monotheists. The idea that we had no religion is totally false, and that someone had to come and save Africans, and that we have an eternal debt of gratitude to pay mm -hmm. to people for coming in from Europe or other places to save us. It's totally false. But even, uh, I've always wanted to ask this yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> but, but even if yeah. we were not monotheistic, right? Uh -huh. even if we believed in many gods, yeah, yeah. what would be the... Well, to me, it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. <laughs> you know, what but to some people, that, yeah. that's a critical... Uh, some people believe that in, in, in the evolution of religious thought, when you reach the point where you believe in one God, that that is the a high superior, uh, su superior position. And that doesn't necessarily have to be okay. true. But I'm just saying, for those people who believe that, then this, his then this history is important. Okay, I'm going to give you six minutes without question. No, you don't have to do that. Because we're going to have to get through these slides. You think we're going to make it? <laughs> that's right. That's right. we got a lot of slides. I'm, 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 we're going to try. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, that was uh, uh, Akhenaten and uh, Nefertiti. This is one of the daughters of Akhenaten and uh, Nefertiti. And I show this because it has the hairdo. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to show you the wigs that I took pictures of this last time in the Cairo Museum. Uh, but when you see wigs on the heads like this, uh, and then go to Cairo in the Cairo Museum and see the wigs that are in the museum, mm -hmm. the actual royal wigs, you know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, they look like you had taken 
uh, the afros that we were wearing in the 60s, those huge afros. Yes. And yes. Uh, even yes. to the extent that they had peppercorn curls on the wig. And looked like them. real. They're yes, yes. And I'm just sorry like that I that. can't uh -huh. show that wig right beside this uh, carving of a person who was wearing one of those wigs. But the wigs were very typical, and they showed uh, uh, the native African hairdo. Uh, this, again, is a picture of the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Now, uh, whenever uh, you begin to dig up mummies that are black, uh, carvings that have big noses and big lips, carvings that have peppercorn hair on them, carvings as these that have elongated heads, which suggest something, quote, abnormal, unquote, for a European, but actually typical for Africans, uh, rather than admit that they're Africans, Frequently, you'll get scholars who will come back and give explanations to say that these were deformed Europeans, as they said with these daughters. Now, one of the deformities here, as with their mother and father, remember Akhenaten and Nefertiti? Mm -hmm. Well, Akhenaten was supposed to be deformed because of his misshapen body and the, the certain features of his face. Well, these daughters are supposed to be deformed because of the elongated heads that they have. And it was said, you know, of course, no normal person has a head that would be elongated like that. Well, all over the African Nile Valley, and in fact, all African people all over the world, uh, if you look at the head shape, this is the most typical head shape among African people, whether that be African or even African American. You know, check out some of your friends the next time that, you know, on the slide. Don't do that. With <laughs> 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 and you'll see uh, that there are many heads that are indeed uh, that are shaped just like this. And these are taken from different parts of the continent of Africa. See, we're all the way over in West Africa mm -hmm. and Congo, and this would, uh, this would be true of almost any African-American audience, for example, that you look mm -hmm. at. And so uh, you don't have to go anywhere out of the valley to explain what you're seeing on the monuments. That's my point in, uh, in uh, showing these extra uh, uh, heads. Okay, this is uh, King Tut, who is Akhenaten's brother, as we indicated. King Tut is a young boy. Uh, he took over, they say, somewhere around the age of nine, and then he was a teenager when it appears that the priesthood might have gotten to him, too, because we know that he started out believing in the religion that his brother had started, the religion of the sun that was symbolized by the sun, uh, the religion of Aten. And uh, we, uh, he then changed his name, though, from Tutan Aten to Tutan Amun, which meant he went back to the old religion. His brother had backslid from Amen to Aten. Mm -hmm. uh, Tut goes back to Amen, which means that the Amun priesthood, which was centered in the 18th dynasty at that city of Luxor, that priesthood then was back in power again. And shortly after that, we find uh, King Tut's uncle coming to the throne, his uncle I. But this was a picture of King Tut. Now let's take a look at uh, King Tut's mummy. See, it's nice we had his carving, now we have his mummy. And notice he has the same head problem that his little sisters had. Yeah. Okay. Then we have uh, the golden mask of King Tut. Some who saw the exhibit for King Tut when he came to the United States will remember uh, this uh, golden mask. Uh, and this is the red granite lion that I told you about in the British Museum. And the inscriptions on this lion say that his father was Amenhotep III. And his brother then would be Amenhotep IV because both of them had the same father. And so that's, that's how I say that because there was some contention about whether King Tut was actually the brother of Akhenaten or not. Um, this is the uh, crown that was uh, part of King Tut's jewelry, one of the crowns. And I won't take the time to go into all the symbolism of the crown. You'll notice the snake and the vulture. I will say these, one thing about them, though. Everything in ancient Africa was symbolic. Uh, for example, the, the vulture can assimilate diversity. It, can, it, 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 it eats a lot of different kind of dead things and assimilates it and turns it into something. The snake symbolizes the splitting function. And as you, you're almost compelled to wonder if they didn't have some indication of how the brain works when you notice that uh, one side integrates like a vulture, the other side disintegrates or dissects uh, like a snake, mm -hmm. which has a forked tongue and also a forked penis. And if you'll notice the snake's body going across the top of the head, uh, approximate some of the sutures that go across the top of the brain, dividing it into two hemispheres right. that have the function, the left brain and the right brain functions, which can be associated symbolically then with these uh, two animals, both of which on the when the crown is worn will appear 
right above the third eye or the pineal gl gland on the uh, head of the, the, the king. Uh, these are, I just put this on the screen too so that you could see some boomerangs that come out of the tomb of King Tut. When that tomb, remember this goes back to the 18th dynastic period, and many people are inclined to believe that the boomerang was indigenous to Australia with aboriginal populations or native populations of Australia. And it may be, but we certainly find them here even earlier than they may have been found in Australia in, uh, okay. in uh, Kemet, maybe suggesting a cultural connection between Australia and Africa. Uh, I'm sorry. I uh, wanted to show you a copy of the golden mask again of King Tut, and then uh, keep this image in mind when I show you the next slide, because the next slide will be a, a picture of uh, a news uh, advertisement for the King Tut exhibit in Los Angeles, coming out of the Los Angeles Times. Okay. I want you to show you the real thing, then I want to show you what an artist does, and that will give you an indication of why we should never accept artist sketches, we should always ask for the original document or the original carving if we can possibly see it. So here's, here's King Tut the way he looked to his artist. Here's King Tut the way he looked to the artist in the Los Angeles Times. He's become caucasoid. And uh, we go back and take a look at the way he really looked. And then this is how he looked in the advertisement at the... Um, he becomes white. He becomes white. Mm -hmm. And this happens frequently with the um, Egyptian figures as they appear in sketches. And this is the reason that we recommend against uh, the use of sketches in textbooks. Wherever possible, we ought to have photographs. And it, even better than that, we ought to have the actual object. Because even in photographs, uh, it's possible that the color is not a, a true rendition of the color, as I indicated with Queen T. Uh, in black and white, you really don't pick up the natural color of the statue as it appears, and it's really better to have a, a, a color picture. And then, of course, look at what's happened to King Tut by the time it gets to the children. Uh, so we, let's go back and look at this again. We start out with the golden mask, mm -hmm. the way he looks. Uh, this is the way the adult population will pick it up in the advertisement in the newspaper.